part of Ethereum Foundation for the past three years or so. And for two years we were working with uh, Remix team. And for the past few months we've been working on this topic, how to make Ethereum more trustless. So we'll show you what we see as a problem. And then hopefully also get your input into what you see as a problem and how, what solutions could you maybe suggest or what you could commit to do so that as a community we bring these things forward and make it more trustless. So. Cool. Um, right. Okay, so that's basically like just a small introduction. Uh, there are many ways to introduce this, but the idea is that this represents like a, a dApp and you could open a wallet to start making an interaction and of course Ethereum executes contracts the way it, it, it does and there is no magic administrator that can do anything about it but the thing is that as a user, when you interact with a dApp then yeah, you have some expectations what this is going to do and what the contract is all about but if you don't have the source code and there's no way of easily verifying it maybe your wallet will show you some data before you confirm the transaction but generally it's not so easy to say is that what you're seeing and doing actually uh, what is happening behind the scenes and even if you do how secure is it has it been audited I mean there's so many levels from having maybe a source code that is verified that you know that this source code is actually the one that is deployed to that contract address that you interact with to is it has it been analyzed has it been audited I mean there's many different levels and the situations can be improved to over what it is currently. Um, then, because if we don't do that, then basically you could use Ethereum as uh, an alternative hosting solution like AWS. I have my backend, I'm using it as a backend, and it's supposed to be trustless, but if in the end you actually have to trust, then yeah, that's, that's not, not a good situation to be in. Um, so right, so we have also some numbers and we have the source there, so basically that data is already a little bit older. Um, so the numbers should be even higher, but like we have a lot of developers that come in touch and try out and learn about uh, Ethereum and the broader ecosystem every month. Like 50,000, that's actually a lot of them. Um, and every, every month, like I mean, it depends, it changes, but like it's 1.5 million contracts that are getting deployed uh, to the chain. And 10, 10, more than 10 million contracts are on chain, but actually it's even more because the data is a little bit older, so con contracts uh, are getting constantly published. And every day, also those numbers are uh, fluctuating, but like 1.2 million contracts uh, calls per day. So that's actually a lot. Um, and the thing is that uh, just when it comes to uh, verified source codes, there are some, uh, many of you are maybe familiar with Etherscan, but generally they are like in the thousands, not in the millions. So of course also some contracts uh, are deployed many times over, but still the situation is not really as good as it maybe could be. Um, and we were thinking what we maybe can do about it to improve it. So the thing is... Um, uh, yeah, so what is also very important here, like we have all these numbers, but the problem is that apart from Etherscan, there is no other place where we could explore or store uh, verified source codes. So that means that it's stored on a centralized place and if they decide to put a paywall on or I don't know, just don't want to open the data, that means that we have a trustless system where we have to trust the contracts, but we don't have access to these contracts. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, is there even an incentive to share the Solidity source code? Or what can we do to, to uh, find out what would be the incentive? Um, and as yeah, you mentioned, there is only a couple of thousands of them, but we have like over 10 million contracts currently on blockchain, so how do we get more verified source codes? Yeah, and um, so the thing is we were thinking maybe if we have like a neutral place that could be used to explore and find information whether there is a source code that is uh, verified, whether it has been analyzed, whether it has been audited, maybe multiple times by different parties. Um, there's so many, so many things that you might want to know about your source. Maybe, maybe you're, you're a, a end user, you interact with a dApp and it uses a smart contract or even multiple ones, or you're a developer and you want to use libraries and maybe those libraries have been audited or not. Um, maybe 
the source code and everything is audited, but the contract itself makes calls to other contracts. So it's not the kind of the source code, but then you also need to know about those contracts. And there's so many different uh, situations uh, that basically that it needs a whole ecosystem of, of uh, projects and organization, and they all are active in slightly different fields, but I think they all need to work together because there's a lot of different aspects to this problem. Um, so, maybe one, one more thing. So the thing is, uh, so that's the neutral place. Like, so basically we need to coll collaborate, and uh, th there's many ways in which we can do it. One way which we were thinking were to have like some kind of open API standards uh, in, in ways that uh, we can basically use uh, the, the, the different projects, uh, services or libraries or whatever they are about and mesh, mesh them and, and to, to improve the situation because one project alone, it's hard for them to, to change uh, everything like Etherscan has all the contracts but then there's auditors but then you have also dev developers and everyone and then you have also wallets so every, everyone has like a user base and has some kind of expertise and you would need to maybe change something and have like a standard or a way of doing things across those different kinds of organizations. Um, and like each project alone might have a hard time of doing it because it requires others to maybe also change something. So that's maybe why the situation is not as good as it could be. And um, yeah, like we want to have it scalable and decentralized. Yeah, so maybe we can uh, now move to this. And this is why we started this project called Smart Contract Codes, uh, which is basically a peer-to-peer -peer database and a search engine for verified source code. So, uh, do you maybe want to? Uh, yeah. I mean, let's just go over quickly. So the idea is maybe this could be a point where we can try out to improve the situation. And uh, there are multiple aspects to this. Like one is we have a lot of. Uh, data that is, um, I mean, for example, for the, so, uh, for the source code and such, we could publish them and then you have a way of retrieving them and maybe verifying them, but like still, uh, there's a, a lot of auditors and uh, also the wallets that might want to show certain information about this and can we publish this? Does that need to be updated? Maybe a, a, a certain contract is updatable or there's multi multiple versions and one has been audited but the next not or maybe you don't only want to use it part of the contract functionality, maybe you interact with like two functions and those maybe have been audited even though the rest has been updated and all these things we need to do and because the data is always changing, I mean, when you deploy the contract, that particular contract is immutable but the whole list of contracts, there will be always new contracts and also maybe new versions of contracts. So in order to get all the, also uh, with the audits, that's kind of the same, like you, you audit maybe the next version of the contract. So all these updates need like a mechanism that you can also easily uh, update and interact and still all in the end, even though the updates are possible, you want to be able to trust or have it as trustless as possible. Um, so yeah, how, how do we do that? Like uh, the idea about this database is that we have, an, first of all, like a neutral place. So you could of course use the peer-to-peer -peer network to retrieve all these kind of different information but also if you have an organization, like as an auditor for example, you could uh, have your own copy of the, the data set but annotated. So for example, you could say, these are all the ones that I uh, uh, contracted that we audited or, and those kind of other versions. And then this information can, could be used on, uh, on one place like uh, this search interface to display all the contracts that have been uh, audited, by whom they have been audited, which versions and there might be updates coming to this, but every, uh, every node of the database under hosted by one particular person or organization could update their annotations and all these different data basically uh, is merged or, or, or shown in uh, like a, a mixed, mixed way. So that's why we also have this second part, the App Connect. Um, maybe, I assume that many of you might know Remix as a in browser IDE, and they have, and that's not the only project, but they have a, this approach of having plugins. Um, and we want to see how we can maybe make it so that it, all these different, like whether they are wallets or whatever is their app or software they're using, that we can connect them together uh, in a way that, like, maybe uh, a particular app or, or whatever, whatever the software is wants to reuse the code, or maybe we on the smart contractor codes would 
allow the, the connection or embed it, so it, it goes both ways. Well, plugin usually as a standalone thing is relatively useless. It only works as a plugin for something, but we want to be able to connect things. So then that way, uh, let's say uh, an auditor uh, that displays their audited contracts uh, could uh, retrieve data from the, or maybe even they have tools to analyze them. So they can use the database to, to import that data and show it on their page, but the other way around is also possible. So the search engine could, uh, or the search interface could display uh, or even offer those kind of services to, to, uh, to for example, analyze the, the, the contracts and give the, the user, uh, or even offer the service like there's an auditor that offers a certain service and it could be, um, it, could, it could be a way for, for users to discover audited contracts and, and uh, the way they, they work. Um, yeah, uh, and because we want this database to be uh, truly decentralized, so everyone can run a node, uh, we're using that protocol, which uh, can handle dynamic data sets. So because there is a database that, and we are constantly publishing new information to it, we can sadly not use uh, IPFS for this, or it doesn't come out of the box. But uh, as Christian will later show, the, the um, source codes will be stored on IPFS, probably, or <laughs> this is one possible solution. Uh, but then we can fetch them and display them in this big database for everyone. So yeah, this is like I mentioned, wallets and auditors, but also of course developer tools. If they um, support uh, publishing source codes like, as an uh, opt-in or maybe ideally as an opt-out mechanism that would also be useful. So somebody who really doesn't want to publish their source code even though you could always put in the effort to decompile and figure out because usually the source codes are meant to be small because anyway expensive to have a lot of storage and computation going on in the chain. Um, that would be of course very useful. So now uh, we just picked like for each category that we see uh, a, a few all, I mean, not all, not random, but like almost like there, there's many more organizations or projects in each of those categories. But uh, just to get like a feeling, what we are, what we personally see, um, what are all the different uh, players in the ecosystem that could contribute uh, and do something to improve the, the status quo. Um, but yeah, that's we would love to discuss to to get more input to maybe update or make the the perspective on this a little bit broader. Yeah, so there are Solidity developers, so people who develop Solidity code, then you have dApps, basically like business owners or somebody who makes a concept of how, how this Solidity code should work. Uh, Dev tools which enable publishing to the network, which basically they could also publish to the database, and then everybody could see what is actually the source code of the, the Dev they're using. Security auditors, of course, taking care of uh, that the, the contract is secure because verified means only that it does what it's supposed to do but it doesn't mean that it's secure so it can still have some bugs or something um, then we have infrastructure projects which basically uh, enable uh, even that this whole thing exists so to, to search for, for things and to, to publish um, and block and data explorers which uh, uh, are basically running nodes and getting information from the blockchain because if every one of us wants to get this information it's a hard job so we need to run it for like months so we have of course like awesome tools that do that and wallets of course because as would be the ones displaying this information that is stored in this peer to peer database so what we wanted this is like a short introduction of like what we do and, and how we are thinking about things but now we would like to hear something from you, like, I don't know, how do you see the ecosystem? Maybe we didn't even manage to capture all the main actors and we forgot something. Uh, what are you doing in the space and what is your role in these terms, like how to build more trust in the ecosystem? Does anybody want to start? Yay, thanks. I did you would also like in a circle like, like I don't know if we should kind it's of rather just like or question. you can come here or just like or, or just uh, just a you know it's a request. So uh, I am David. Uh, I have a phone that runs Linux OS. 
which is the kind of open source version of Android. So I use Android applications a lot when I'm, for example, I want to use a wallet, a crypto wallet. And uh, a lot of times I can download a crypto wallet APK uh, from anywhere else, only from, like, pirated from Google Play. Not very many developers uh, publish only on Google Play. Uh, or if I can get the APK uh, from their GitHub or from someone else, the APK is not signed with their PGP key. They don't even have the PGP uh, key for their releases. So I can't really verify if it's really what I, what I download is really uh, what was meant to be installed on my phone. So like, this is my reach out, my, uh, my uh, cry of help. So please learn PGP, make a PGP signing key, uh, and uh, always sign your releases. And also publish, uh, a also publish APKs uh, on GitHub, on your website. And please, 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 if you can and have the bandwidth for it, uh, publish uh, your application on uh, F-Droid, such as my good friend Linky does with his wallet, uh, Walid. Uh, because, like, when I'm thinking of how to make this ecosystem trustless, I believe that is a uh, crucial point of trust, you know, the applications that you put in your, in your device and your device. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to uh, say, and thank you for attention. I'd like to a very good point, uh, which we skip like probably many more. Um, so the thing is, uh, that would be super cool to have everything, uh, all the like all the software that enable uh, enables uh, uh, this to work. I mean, many things are published either to the, to the app stores, but of course also on GitHub we have a lot of things. And yeah, they should of course always be ideally signed, uh, and the keys should be known from the teams or people that publish, so that I can actually verify that uh, what we use is coming from the right sources and is hopefully working the way it's supposed to work. Uh, just the thing, I think that basically we cannot do this with a microphone because this is going to be crazy. Should we just like start yeah. discussion like... Please. Um, I, I, I think the single uh, most effective thing we could do is the compiler publishing the source codes, uh, um, uh, what's the name of that thing that you were telling me about, the uh, swarm hash, and then actually publishing the source to swarm without, uh, as a default. I think if we made that the default, then 99% um, of these pieces of source code would be available because um, people wouldn't turn it off. And it would also promote an idea that we should all be publishing all of our source code and we should all be interacting with smart contracts that have published source code. So we make the community ethos that the code is there. And if somebody wants to turn it off, then I would look at them and say, why did you turn it off? But I think that's the most effective by far. I think trying to get people to volunteer, you're going to end up four years from now with 3,200 published smart contract. So Chris works uh, in a Solidity team. Do you, Chris, know why is this not a default? Why, what are the obstacles? So I think the compiler is unfortunately not the right tool to do this. And the main reason is, first, uh, you do not know whether the source code that is currently being compiled is the final thing that will be published, or some random people are just testing some stuff. And second, uh, the compiler may not even have access to the network and the results might be uh, so the, the compiler is used to generate bytecode and then bytecode is moved somewhere else and then published there. So, okay, so I think uh, the tools that do the smart contract deployment should do that. So and I agree it should be the default, yes. Okay. <laughs> is there any efforts to communicate that to the people that are writing that code? I'm talking to them, yes. Uh, and you built even, or like, did you build some tool to enable that? Or I, uh, you were just basically promoting the idea. Yeah. I think that's also what we try to invite tool makers so that they might consider to at least have like an uh, opt-in, ideally probably an opt-out version to publish uh, the source code. Um, and I think also it's relatively new that like uh, 
the IPFS uh, address of source code would be published to when, when I deploy the code? Is that so the, I mean, at least the, 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 the deployed bytecode of every smart contract has a hash of a JSON file at the end. And uh, this JSON file contains uh, information like uh, the ABI, the compiler that was used uh, to, to compile the source code, and also uh, yeah, link hashes to the source code. So the, the integrity of all this is not the problem. The problem is the data availability here. And I think if, if we could get to a point where people publish that information at the point of deployment, then also the, the user experience of wallets, for example, would greatly improve, not only because you have access to the source code, but only because you have access. So this, this JSON file contains, uh, I'm not sure if I said it, uh, ABI, and also the, the nut spec comments of uh, the functions. So whenever you have a, when, whenever your wallet asks you to confirm a transaction, it should not display this uh, garbled hex string of data uh, it should actually fully decode all the function parameters and display the, the NetSpec comment that is associated with this function. So, yeah. I mean, also we were thinking maybe, for example, wallets, they could display, like, if the data was available, so if tools all fully... Uh, if, if we, in general, like, establish this as, a, like, a mindset that it would be better for everyone if we had the source code because the Ethereum is meant to be trustless, but that's kind of a missing link. And if we don't do that, then why would we do all this in the first place? Then I can also just go back to how things always worked. <laughs> um, but okay, so if we if we have that and we, we maybe have the tools publishing this and we are getting more source code, and this is also pretty cool because then wallets could of course display if a certain transaction is happening with like a contract where at least the source code is known. Um, but then ideally also uh, any like auditor or se any, any, any security related project could, uh, could analyze the source codes easier because there's many of them available or even publish like a kind of annotation um, in which form, that's the question, but like basically having an opinion that this source code has been audited uh, and ideally we also get to standards like what, what does it mean, what level of auditing happened and who, who was it audited by one organization or by many uh, and, and is there like even like a, a rating? I mean, there's so many metadata that could be generated uh, uh, that basically have like additional information because the source code as such is like a good first step. Uh, so of course we need them to be available. But okay, but this is for the future. What about for the past? Who were you working with? Your auditing uh, contracts. Like, is there like uh, would clients be up for sharing their code? Yeah. So. Um yeah, so I'm a, well, yeah, we are a security auditing company and typically um, the majority of clients want to publish the fact that they have gotten an audit and also want to publish the full audit report, right, which is uncommon compared to other industries. Um, so it would, um, I think it would be great to highlight both positive and negative examples. Um, so recently there was a good Neg I mean, a famous negative example, which was Fairbit, right, where people um, looked into the contract and were like, there's definitely a problem here. And you could warn the user saying, like, look, please don't put any more money in, because at the time that the vulnerabilities were published, people were still putting more money in. Um, not like Some people were saying it was money laundering, but that's a, another issue. Um, so yeah, I think it would be great to kind of have like a, there could probably be like three different things. Like there could be like a check mark, like it has been audited and when you click on the check mark, you see like the full report or there could be like a, a warning and these could go to different sources, right? Like, so I mean, ideally, of course, this shouldn't just be us and uh, people shouldn't just all trust us because that's not the idea, but like would be great but anyway. Um, so yeah, like uh, any, there could be five check marks, and then you go to the different sources, and like so that anyone can can provide their opinion. But do you also audit sometimes like some code that is not like coming from the client, but you just uh, analyze it anyway? Yeah, so we often have dependencies um, that are already existing, right? So like uh, some client code is using I don't know 
uh, compound or maker or whatever. Uh, so existing dependencies that we can look at this. And do you publish this data anywhere? Like, so this is in your know-how database or something? Yes. Would you be willing to share this information? Like, sure. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, we were thinking like if there was a standard, I mean, there's okay one standard, like what does it mean uh, uh, to have an audit and what levels and, and what does, what does that, what kind of guarantees does it maybe give, but another one, if there was like a, a, a format, like a data format standard, then maybe, uh, for example, I mean, in our project that would be useful, but generally wallets could use it to, just like the basic that would be, yes, the, the source code exists, but like, what about, does it, ha does it, has it been audited, so they could basically grab that data from, in a, and they know it's a standardized format so they can display that and hopefully all the wallets would use the same standard so users get used to it, uh -huh, this is how it looks and, and that's what it means and maybe even if I click the link I can see on-chain in any maybe block explorer or whatever that this is what it means, they explain it again and show it and that could improve but also one thing is that tool makers integrate this opt-in, opt-out uh, version to publish source code but if wallets would integrate this this would also create another like pressure to maybe or incentivization to publish source codes because if users every time they confirm now see oh I'm interacting with all the time with contracts that, that kind of give me like a warning or something that it hasn't been uh, the, the source code doesn't even exist or maybe then later on uh, okay it has been audited but what, what does it even mean is it like how 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 in depth has it been audited and then maybe users would even change their behavior and either demand this or maybe switch to alternatives that, that have it better audited and then everybody would think like hmm, maybe you should also publish or get an audit um, so that, uh, that would be one thing uh -huh. that's perfect very... Jan from Remix to uh, we, we are discussing basically like what are the problems of getting the source code and you basically just now introduced something that people who are building on Remix can publish the source code oh, yeah. So that's like a good example. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully with more with so IPFS. So is it the, a default thing or the, do do users have to select? Or no, is it opt in or opt out? They have to click on it. Ah so then uh, right at the moment opt in. they have to click, yeah. Alright. Because they be it was virtual to publish. Do you have any like ideas why would what be better? Like do I'm you sorry? that you will automatically publish and that just users opt out? Because maybe that would create more published systems. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I think at first I, I was a bit uh, afraid of automatically publishing. All right. But now I talk to the channel. I feel like so. it should be a Maybe opt out at least. Yeah. 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 We also have published as well. You, you are working on Brownie, which is a Python uh, truffle in Python. Or <laughs> it's a framework, yeah. Yeah, I, I also feel that publishing, like an opt out, it seems a bit, it's a, it's a large assumption to make. Yeah. Right? If it's someone working on, on something sensitive that shouldn't be published and you, you just push it because they forgot to change the box, that seems a bit. That's but I think opting in is, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. There's something halfway between not publishing and publishing the source. You can publish the function signatures and the and the uh, encoded um, value. Basically, a thing that you would get from the ABI file. You don't have to publish the entire source. Just publish the ABI. Just the strings of the functions and their corresponding encoded value, the four byte encoding. And then that way they could be a wallet could decode the function. But you want you wouldn't have published the person's source code without the permission. You've actually published something that's public anyway. So that may be a halfway point. Yeah, but you, I mean, you can you can publish the metadata file without the source code. Yeah. Then you have I mean that also includes NetSpec, which might be sensitive. Yeah, but I mean, if it's motivated, you could just go in and buy code and look at the function selector, so... Well, not anyone. Well, anyone who's very technical could, yeah. so you'd be helping the non, the less technical yeah. people. Is there a way to... I mean, if the deployment process is an interactive process, then 
that tool could also just ask where you have to answer with yes or no. Yeah, that would make, I, like in an interactive process, yeah, but if it's just scripting, yeah, that yeah, would sure. be very, yeah. If you're developing something sensible and you forget to check a box, you probably shouldn't be developing something <laughs> sensible. No, but you were a, a, a wallet developer. What is like from your perspective? Do you think that this data is? Yes, I would love to display that, and I would also be aggressive there and just publish that. People that just do closed source stuff on blockchain, I think they should, should just be screwed. But I'm a bit radical there, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, but I know that there's really against that. For example, like the crypto kitties that have this um, closed breathing function or stuff. Um, but currently, I think we should just blame them. We should just really. But currently, we would blame everyone because uh, that's also. Oh, that is fun. But where is the problem? I mean, do you think that like education would help? That if people just knew that this is important. They would do it, or is it yes, like to make it easier for them? So I think what uh, what we do really good stuff. So like, it's just easier because people have a lot of things to do. I understand that, um, and it's just an extra step, and they were kind of finished. And now there's an extra step, um, so it would be nice if it gets just easier. Um, that is built into their process. And, then, okay. uh, and ideally, let people opt out. So maybe it can also be a transition phase. Maybe we make it first like. Opt in and then after some time, you can send it. Yeah, like they did, yeah. Like now it's like you have to check, later is you have to uncheck. I think, like, uh, like in the front end, like, uh, everybody is like used to that, like, all this uh, the code is like plainly visible, but like when it comes to back end, that was kind of never the case. And now with blockchain or smart contracts, it's kind of kind of a new and maybe people just need to get used to it. But, uh, a couple of things that come to mind. Um, you mentioned about um, function that's being displayed. Uh, there was um, an optimization that you can turn on in the compiler which will just reduce the size of your contract by taking the contract names out, uh, so the function names out. So people will start turning that on to save on gas for upload. So you can't really rely on that. Also, those function names will probably be in English and some of these French would it, c it comes down to defaults in the end, like what, what, what's on, because 90% of people probably wouldn't choose to do those types of things. So it would improve the situation. Yeah, I suppose what they were. What about having something like, um, uh, like a secret source tag or something like that, where when you're writing the code, you just have a little comment in it saying, oh, this, this function is secret source. Okay, it's, it's closed. It's always right, yeah, it has been audited, it. but we can't reveal this. Uh -huh. So, and then just call it secret source and say, there we are. So this is so so the whole contract. Do you, you mean like, that, like, uh, like as an indicator to the uh, developer tools to, to say, okay, I'm coming to everything, but not that problem? Or? Uh, I'd say to make so you don't actually include it. Right, so it's not part of the upload, um, but you know you've declared it as there's a good reason why this is not displayed because it's a trade secret. It's probably hard to verify the source. Of the but source. it has, but then you can have a tag on it. You know, in order to declare it a secret source, you have to be audited by somebody who's reputable and someone signs <laughs> oh, right, to say yeah. this was audited, but it's secret. If you want to find so out more, contact the, this address for an NDA. The verification would maybe. Fail because I don't have all the original source code, but like still yeah, it could be yellow, but not red. Yeah. Okay, right. I think uh, when uh, the editors uh, editing the code, uh, if they think it's ready to publish, they can just upload publish to uh, some website. And when when we upload to the website, we can use the compiling uh, binary to, to do a hash and use the hash to as an ID to save the code. And then when they deploy, uh, they can they also use the har the hash. They also <coughs> can get the hash, right? And then uh, detect whether the load, the code has been published. If yes, they can say uh, whether you uh, you can use the, the link as a, a save to the uh, smart contract that they deploy. And then when user use it, the link is exit there. If they want to check uh, whether the, the source code, they can just uh, if they find a link there, they can check the source code. And when they click, they will go to the website to see the exactly back, uh, the, the code there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we should actually collect all the, these things. And the thing is, that's why we prepared this link for it to download, like, on the internet. <coughs> no, but 
one. But uh, one more thing I wanted, sorry, just like because Victor is yeah. from Thanks. Rock Scout and they are actually also a source of uh -huh. getting the verified yes, source. Thank Thanks for having me. So I, I would like to add some comments uh, what we have in Rock Scout. So Rock Scout is his open source blockchain explorer. So not only users can have centralized uh, database of verified source codes. Uh, so what, what we provide for users, uh, we have a uh, uh, user interface to form the application and also what is more important, we have API for, for uh, verification process. And uh, what is important, uh, so uh, users can, uh, should provide more metadata like a compiler version or the API. Uh, so, and, uh, we and contract will be verified and our centralized database. But what is more important is that we have a point to get all these contracts. And we, uh, compared to users, we have no rate limits. So this, does it, does this mean that everyone can, can get the copy of Block Scout verified, verified source codes uh, if, if they want? So, of course, we have a pagination because of uh, 100, uh, how much? Uh, Ten thousands of uh, verified smart contracts, something like that. Through blocks code. Yes. So, so and everyone, and, uh, this is more important that everyone can get this. So this is uh, our the current vision of decentralization, right? So everyone can get the copy of our database. So what what, what I would like to add also. Uh, uh, so to to to, to go, I, I like your idea about uh, decentralized database, and I think. Uh, uh, we would like to participate in that, so, uh, yeah. but, so it, it can be another way. So, uh, in order to increase trustlessness, we, we need to increase the number of uh, verified smart contracts, right? And what uh, what ways uh, can we what ways can we choose to accomplish that? I think there are four basic ways. The first, the first one, we need to educate users as much as we can to, uh, to create uh, articles in, on GitHub, in, in GitHub repositories, on Medium, on forums, somewhere else, how to verify, how, to, how is it easy, uh, what instruments we can use for, for verification. The second one uh, is based on assumption that user will always forget to verify the, uh, the uh, smart contracts. Huh? Thus we need to somehow to embed a verification step into the all development tools we have for now, like uh, desktop applications like uh, Embark, Truffle, uh, Brownie, whatever is alive. So, to, to web applications, Remix, Play, uh, right, uh, MetaMask. Uh, so, this is the second. So, uh, so, it's important to have a verification step on the, on the deployment process. So, of course, yeah. sure. so, as soon as you Publish metadata and source code. Verification is automatic. It's not an additional step. Uh, you mean to publish where? Uh, Swarm and IPFS. Yeah, sure. I mean, cool. And so th that's also the, the hope. So as soon as we publish this, then block explorers. So you don't need to go to the block explorer to verify uh, your, your contract. The block explorer itself can do it, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. But not everyone has uh, publishing to Swarm, right? Not sure, the tools need that. Yeah. Yes, yes. And this is now like for some that are already published and could come and, and verify, basically. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something. Hi, I'm Nick, and I work on VPN. And our like, marketing isn't so good, but um, I think these are like, useful for a lot of these problems. Um, VPN is just like a standardized data format. Um, it includes everything we talked about, bytecode, source code, APIs. Also specifies like deployment data, so you can also, um, in terms of getting this like strong verification, you can add like on-chain deployments, so you know you're interacting with like the DAI you're supposed to interact with like whoever's wallet address. Um, and so yeah, like check out EPM. We're in Brownie. We're in Remix. We have a plugin. We're in Truffle. Um, it's just like a very good way to pass around safely your smart contracts. Love to see more integration and tooling. Come talk to me. Happy to help. Website documentation. We have a registry explorer. Um, I just yeah. Just want to it. Is there one way to do it to actually have the if I if I'm able to build that contract 
and it's binary identical with what's deployed, then I know, know everything about it. I know all the um, dependencies and stuff like that. So I can, I can do anything I want to verify it and run all the tests and everything like that. And to do that, I don't need that much information because if you know the project and the git commit, then I can get that code and I can build it. And it's exactly what's deployed. I, I can do anything there. Like, I can, like the, we, um, Gary and I wrote one of the Bitcoin wallets and we were really worried about the dependency attacks. Someone changes one of the libraries that we use. It gets into our code and it's a little wallet stealer. And so Gary wrote a little verify, verify on all our dependencies that nobody changed anything without our knowledge. But that's in the build tools. And that's, that's well away from what the users will see. But if you can, if someone can rebuild it and you get identically what's deployed, you, you learn a lot from that. And you can automate it as well. Yeah, how can you do that if it's more than <laughs> This is one angle. The other angle is the upgradability of the smart contract. So yeah. now he's talking about dependency and also how about having a proxy smart contract and changing the business logic of the what you are pointing to. <coughs> so this is also should be also considered. Yeah. Yes, yeah. definitely. This, I mean, one thing is to that display what is verified <coughs> in the sense of like bytecode matches actual smart contract, I mean, the uh, compilation result. Uh, but another thing is, yeah, is it safe and all this additional information? Uh, or is it using oracles? And like, is it depending on oracles so that like users know that they're interacting with something that could maybe be corrupt? So we, we would like to be able to, I mean, smart control codes is just an interface, but what we want to focus on mainly is the database. Yeah. And so, so the thing is, like, we're, we're, we're already scraped, scraped together quite a lot of uh, source code, but now the uh, situation changes, and in the future, maybe the, the, the developer tools will always, maybe ideally automatically, but okay, let's publish the source code, let's say by IPFS or Swarm, then all the, of them are available. Now the question is still where do we get the list of all of them? So maybe there can also be a solution for this, and then we can start annotating them because once we I'm sorry, can say Michelle, it would be better if you got them to come to you rather than you come to them. So if you can incentivize it for kind of like an awarding company, yeah. yes. then they can earn continuous revenue you know, by yeah. by auditing this, putting it on your database. Of because course. you act as a as a gateway. So that if somebody says, oh, I want this thing, I want to verify this, uh, uh, this smart contract, I can see you marked it as yellow, I want to know why. Okay, they go to the button and says, oh, that will be a token uh, right, amount, it right, will cost you half a pence. And then. Just one comment before uh, uh, I give you a word, but like, uh, it's not our database. That's, I think, yeah, the whole sorry. point because so like, yeah, right. everybody can so run a right. node, and then if you run your yeah. node, you can add yeah. more data and I run my node and I can sync. I have yes. some logic built in that I... Yeah, the decentralized system yes. that runs so this. This is right. the most, so right. because yeah. nobody wants to empower somebody yeah. who grabs the okay. data. Understood. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay, my point is, I misspoke you, right? Um, yeah. My point you is that um, you incentivize the actors within it so that they can each earn money right, off yes. each other. Yes. So that way they want to grow the system so they continue to get uh, revenue yeah. by people getting, you know, you know, sort of requesting audit reports. Yeah. And so they can charge for the audit report. Yeah. So that's, that's and so, yeah, you know, so that gives an incentive for the auditor right, to, you know, to audit as many things yeah. as possible and then make those um, reports available. And also the people who wrote the smart contracts yeah. If they do them correctly, they get a share of the audit report right? yeah. So that's that's another challenge that we, for example, see like exactly. even if all the smart contracts, for example, by uh, adding something to the developer tools, would be published to IPFS or Swarm, and of course on chain we have, uh, and of course the metadata too, and then on chain we have like a hash to verify that this is the right metadata. Still, where do I get the list of all of them? So it would be good to also find one way to publish the list of all the metadata, or all the links at least, like all the IPFS hashes that exist. Is there <coughs> so my plan is to write a small tool that constantly uh, monitors the, the blockchain for new liquid contracts and create a gigantic IPFS database uh, that contains all source codes of all published, uh, all small contracts. So the hash that is uh, on-chain con con contains the address too? 
How will you update this one? How, how, like, whenever one there's person? a new contract published, <coughs> how do you find so the address where it's published? Is that on chain? Uh, for is it using a topic on like, DHT no, 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 like, and then like, like the developer tool public has a source code, publishes it to IPFS, and the developer tool then returns maybe to the user the address, or I have the, the source code anyway, so I can figure out the address. But then I publish it to the chain, but and now somebody detects that there's a new contract on chain, but how do I know where that source code is stored? I mean it's stored now, and if I had the source code, I the can hope is that the deployment tools publish it to swarm IPFS. The and then you can uh -huh. grab it via the metadata and the link in the metadata and then keep it persistent but in that big data. Where do I get the metadata from? From the hash link in the bytecode. Uh -huh. So the hash link in the bytecode contains the address of Swarm or IPFS for yes. the metadata. Yes. Alright, so then that would be perfect. So if that happens and all the tools will publish, then you could uh, go to the blockchain data, get all these addresses and slowly pull them all and fill them into one database. And then uh, the, the system that we are currently using uh, is a little bit like a version controlled torrent system. So the more peers, they and you, so you can update that torrent. The address doesn't change. So for example, auditors could run it and make their annotations. So they can say, okay, this one has audited up to that level and so on. Um, but also maybe other organizations could start saying, um, I annotate this contract into uh, somebody, somewhere on a con smart contract, uh, stake some money because they want an audit. Uh, but maybe the audit, to, to do the whole audit is a little bit expensive, so maybe we uh, publish that and then we could retrieve all these data and see, aha, uh -huh, there's like a, a lot of contracts that have stakes and we just show those. And maybe that's already a selection, like that's an interesting co contract, maybe it's a library that does certain things that we could use to build other smart contracts. And now this one seems to be a very uh, interesting library. Let's stake more and then maybe also auditors could use that to bid to actually do the audit and then get paid from that. And so that could be additional incentives. So one is like uh, about figuring out if somebody's willing to stake some money to pay for an audit. Another one could be publishing like audits or kind of other kind of metadata that some organization that analyzed things thinks that this contract uh, has an opinion about that contract and that's maybe also valuable. So that kind of system would work, but of course, you first need like the, the basic data set. Uh, and so, that's what I want to add. Yeah, we were implementing the Freebox um, interface and site remix as a plugin recently, and we were thinking about um, because sometimes you want to build your, your, your smart contract, you want to keep it private because for any reason, maybe it's not finished, maybe it's not digital, whatever. Then you want to make it publish like any um, social network. Uh, and with Freebox, is exactly the kind of thing they do. They are just creating like your your own box based on your. Uh, uh, Ethereum address, and then you can even like flag this contract, uh, I build this contract, and then you can create a whole social network, and then it's actually incentivized without any, any question about staking any money on whatever, yeah. because you're just saying like in GitHub, oh, I, I built this contract, you know, and then I have the record of all the contracts I'm building. It's another way of uh, incentivizing what without having to publish everything. Just saying, okay, I built this contract, and maybe then you have someone that can just give an annotation on his stripe saying, oh yeah, I audited this contract, I think it's good, and he's putting his name yeah. on, on, on that thing. So mm -hmm. that's another way of incentivizing without thinking always with uh, cryptocurrency. Like. Um, he didn't speak yet, so that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I work on uh, Apple Wallet, one of the other apps. Uh, a huge part of our effort is working on something we call token script. Uh, it's, it's open source and we submit it to OECs for standardization. But basically, it's a, it's a layer on top of smart contracts. So within the token script client, if you want to make a call to a smart contract, you write it in an XML file, which we provide the schema for. By writing it, by declaring it in the XML file, that means you have to specify exactly what is the function name, the argument type, and so forth. So one thing it helps is when the user makes a smart contract call from within the token script point, within a, within a wallet which supports token script, we can display the function and the arguments, you know, what it does. So a user who knows what it is can, can see what's being called. And I think it, which is more important is because it is built and transported as one single file, 
we can let the author of the XML file sign it, expressing trust for the smart contract. So when the user use it, you'll be like using a, a, a web browser. You visit a website, you see a lock, and you can click on the lock and see that this is verified by who, and this is a certificate issued for this this domain, yahoo.com. And I think we should like, collect all these things because that's exactly the thing. Like there are maybe standards and certain ways of doing things, but yeah, that's that's what yeah. we need to. And what talk. is the most important thing? Because if we are talking about the decentralized Ethereum and trustlessness for real, we cannot rely on any centralized authority who will say this is certified or not. No, no, this, this is based on the chain of trust because you can trust that the signer of this file uh, is asserting that this smart contract can be trusted. Because as a user, when you use a wallet app, you're not going to look at the source code of the contract. But it's very unlikely you will go and look for the source code. And even if you can find the source code for the smart contract, how do you associate that back to the button which you're clicking? Is, is that going to call that smart contract? But if you see a lot, like when you are in the web browser, you see that it has a valid HTTLS certificate, then to a certain extent, because you know that this certificate is issued by say very signed by chain of trust. You trust that this website is who they say they are, and you can trust that you can buy a product from this website using your credit card chain of trust. So you wouldn't have to use you know the regular CA service because you've got PC gears, you've got elliptical a curve signing anyhow. So you just sign by it could still be two dollars like the if you've got, if you control an address, then there's a private key behind that address. You can sign by that. So you might have, you might have something that's created by a pseudonymous key. But everybody knows who they are because they're signing by a well-known address, and that has never changed since the start of the project. So you don't have to rely on very sign or anybody like that. You might as well use the little curve technology to to do the signing. So. Maybe we should have a place, like originally we thought about a document, maybe how do we collect all these things? Yeah, because we are kind of having the last five minutes. I was just, I just wanted to add, because we have GSO also from SUPO, uh, which is also a um, like tool for, for uh, security analysis. Do you have any thoughts? Because I invited him especially <laughs> and like, you didn't have any opportunity. Yeah, uh, already skipped like at the early like, discussion. So we're the security audit firm. We also have like for verifier and also a section tool. But what we focus is more developer friendly way. The reason for that is actually we care about the code privacy. So what we talked was like we have to publish all the source code on the like, swarm or like any anywhere. But most of our clients it might be like it's Korean culture but they doesn't want to share their code before publish because we have to change this. <laughs> yeah. So we have to uh, build some technology for uh, which is keeping the code privacy. So what we extract from the source code is some code pattern, not just source code exact but more abstracted code uh, like intermediate you know, intermediate language like that. So we extract it and then make a signature of them and then we just uh, give uh, and the clients give just that signature. So based on our vulnerability database, we just search from our database. So we just need an original source code. So it's similar to the like traditional Java software, like NPM's uh, vulnerability analysis platform or the Android Play project. So it could be achieved more code privacy first uh, and developer friendly for the audience. But maybe you could <coughs> offer, you know, like some premium service so if somebody wants to no, do like the hardware. No, actually already like analysis. publish all the signature from, that we fetched from the while in the real world. So. In terms of uh, trustlessness, I was thinking that maybe you could offer them yeah, like we, a premium service. Yeah, we can service. also like publish on the Swarm or more yeah. uh, decentralized software to anyone who use it. Yeah. I mean, the, the way, uh, it's, it's maybe a little bit early, but like the, the way we were thinking of, about uh, supporting that kind of use case, like if you want to publish the contract with a full audit, or maybe you just want to say that the, the contract that is behind an address is private, but we have an, an audit about it that we share fully or, or just like parts of it, or maybe in the future you want to share more or you share it the next one. Um, this peer to peer database node that is uh, it's open source and you could run it. You have a, uh, a globally public address as a 
public key, and you, it's, a, it's like a torrent, which means you can start adding all this kind of information to that torrent that is globally available through the public address, and you with the private key or the organization is the only one that can add data. But everybody who is also running the same node, they might also be auditors or other parties that can do the same, and they have an address, but those nodes sync. So everybody would also, the same as a torrent, can retrieve all that data from you, so that if they, at any point in time, even if, if in one particular time your server or database goes down, everybody who already synced the database still has a data available as a read-only version, but it means like all the information about which conflict was audited uh, uh, or what, what kind of information published is, is available in the same standardized format and it is available by all the others, which could then be used to display either in wallets or in any kind of application certain information that comes from a decentralized system where you have, uh, where you can publish as much data as you want and it doesn't cost you anything um, to, and, and, and update that, right? you make it available in that format so uh, wallets could uh, show that there's an audit happening or... And the most important thing is that like nobody is one maintainer mm -hmm. and there is not like database of everything everywhere but nobody collects them or if they do then they have like crazy power because then they, yeah. they have all the data so this kind of system could help us that we all share this data if we commit to, to do something like this or if we find better ways thank god i mean but this is like our suggestion so yeah, we were even thinking like that could help because i was like on point in the very beginning when you have one contract and you have a new version of that contract so the author could pu continuously publish the different versions and they would all be available uh, version controlled through all the, the different versions o uh, over the lifetime of that contract and because they're in that same standard uh, system you could for example not even publish the entire uh, source code but like uh, if, if you wanted to do that you could basically point to that address of that source code and annotate it and that annotation is basically controlled by your private key while the update of the source code is controlled by the private key of, of the author or the organization that develops it further. There's a, it's not a question, it's about a suggestion. You are thinking about a solution on top of the protocol itself, on top of the net itself. However, if you have uh, any idea of interacting with the Ethereum community to implement the solution or part of the solution to be part of the protocol itself. Let me imagine this. A compiler. The compiler is the standard of the compiler. When it compiles a smart contract, it's going to generate a state field representing this contract is uh, uh, certified or not and the level of certification slash two embedded functions out of the box coming from the compiler that change the state of the level of certification so this is in the protocol layer. on top of that whatever solution you can build that benefits from this change in the protocol itself I mean, the certification is a problem because who, uh, I mean, what, if you mean by certificate that it's secure, that somebody did the audit, that's hard because then we have to trust certain parties. But if you mean verification in the sense that we have access, that this address we can easily match to a certain source code, this could potentially work, but as you said, there are problems like first, can solve the data availability problem. <laughs> yeah, and the compiler cannot publish, it doesn't live on the internet, so it's not possible practically. No, I'm not, I'm not saying Notes that you, you publish, when you notes. generate the bytecode, partially part of the compiler job is to produce functions that not exist in the actual source code, that enable a certificate authority to verify the, the smart contract. Also, you have a state variable representing if this uh, smart contract has been verified or not, or certified or not. I think this concept is way too complicated to easily be embedded in, in storage. 
Because ver what does verification mean? Some person said something about that smart contract. Uh, you can't first assume, number. assume probably uh, there would need to be first a solution to develop some kind of best practice. What, what all this can even means, what, what levels, and how, how should that even look like? And then once this is established, and it probably takes some time, then maybe in the future somebody could think of this, and maybe that makes actual sense. But I they showed me that time is up. Uh, yeah. But I, I would love that we could, I mean, this is a super interesting discussion, and we cannot solve it alone. So we we need to use this as a discourse. Yes, yes. this is the question. Discourse or Telegram or what? Can we vote? Yeah, who is for Discord? Discord? Discourse because it's much more system. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Telegram? Okay. Email? Hmm? Email? <laughs> Do we have email? I mean, yes, email. Yeah. 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 If we have emails, then we can send them. Once you've decided on a nice interactive yes. way of being able to do it, yes. then yeah. just send out emails. Or GitHub. GitHub or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Gitter. Yeah. Everybody uses Gitter? Gitter, yeah. yeah. So long as you can have topics with conversations. Yeah. That's all you need. Thank you very much for your participation. And for coming, this is awesome.